Welcome to our panel on Accelerating Enterprise Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning Innovation. I am super excited to have two guests from two organizations that have really been leading in this space for quite a while. I'm Sean Nandi. I work for Amazon Web Services where I run solution architects for our strategic accounts. And the guests with me here today are first, Mike Haley, VP of Research at Autodesk, and Carly Yoder, our GM of Artificial Intelligence at GE Healthcare. Mike, can you tell us a little bit about your role? Sure, thanks, Sean. Yeah, so as you said, I, I head up the research group at Autodesk. Um, part of my role is creating various centers of excellence in technology to keep Autodesk on the forefront of leveraging technology for designing and creating things in the world. Um, but part of my role over the last five or six years has also been really establishing a true machine learning practice at Autodesk. That's a very large focus for research right now, but it's also been a dedicated focus to get the company prepared and leveraging machine learning in all of our products and solutions. Awesome. And Carly, please tell us about yourself and your role. Sure. Thanks, Sean. And thanks so much uh, for having me here for this discussion. Really looking forward to it um, and looking forward to learning from Mike as well. So my role is the general manager of artificial intelligence um, across uh, the business we do here at GE Healthcare. So what that means is um, I get the joy of leading our engineering, data science, and product teams as we work to understand how we can apply AI to make devices and solutions smarter. Um, and then also working with a startup ecosystem to help folks who are really brilliant in driving innovation in this space bring their innovations into the healthcare workflows. Um, so it's, it's, it's a job where I get to get up every morning and think about how we can bring the best of AI to help uh, providers all over the world provide the best outcomes and solutions to their patients. How has AIML started to change the role of the designers and in, in impacting your customers in general? What's it doing for their experiences? It's fascinating. So if you look at the average designer, whether you're talking manufacturing, construction, media, or entertainment, the average designer has really two fundamental things that they're dealing with. One of them is that the process of design is actually about bringing an enormous number of variables together. I mean, imagine designing a building. I mean, you have to think of the people in the building, the function of the building, the materials of the building, the heating of the building, how the building is created. It, it, there are literally tens of thousands of variables that can go into creating a building and most other products as well. No designer, no human designer at least, can actually take all of those tens of thousands of variables and truly give them each the attention they deserve while you're designing. It's just our brains can't handle that capacity. So machine learning has the ability, has, is beginning to provide the ability for designers to start taking all of those requirements and objectives and constraints and all of that and interpreting them and helping guide them through the design process to better designs at the end of the day that are almost a little bit beyond what a human by themselves might be able to come up with. So that's the first thing. The, the other thing that, that, that designers struggle with terribly today, and you know, it's largely the creation of all of us in the software business, is there's a lot of tedium in design. You know, not everything is creative in the design process. You have to translate files, or you have to do lots of small drawing of details, or you have to figure out how to, how to get something moved to a process to the right person in the next stage of a, of a, of a construction um, project, say, for example. None of those are creative things. So um, machine learning is beginning to provide automated mechanisms to start doing that. And that's wonderful, because then that gives more time for the creative creative people to spend time doing precisely that, creating. That makes total sense. You know, it's interesting. I got to work in the uh, media industry for a long time, and it was very painful to see designers have to flip from that tedious work until they get into the fun yes. stuff. So it's, it's exciting to hear how you're changing that. So, so Carly, you know, for almost everyone right now, healthcare is top of mind. How is AIML affecting your customers? How are they sort of leveraging the change experiences in, in your field? Yeah, sure. So uh, I love how, how, how Mike focused in on um, the time that we can give back uh, to the folks who use his solutions. It's, it's very similar here in healthcare. I mean, um, this year has been, uh, you know, a far extreme 
But even before the global pandemic, healthcare systems across the world were pressed on costs, razor thin margins, pressed on time with more folks who needed care than they could give care to, um, pressed on outcomes, pressed on burnout. Um, you know, a recent study showed that around, you know, 27% of a clinician's time actually gets to be with patients. No one went into healthcare to spend 73% of their time doing administration or documentation or paperwork. And so often when we think about what AI can do in healthcare, we think about how it can put the patient back in the center of healthcare. It can take tasks that providers were already doing and do them faster, do them more efficiently. Let the provider focus their precious time on those high level tasks that only they can tackle or explaining and connecting with the care team surrounding the patient or actually interacting with the patient. So a lot of what we have uh, done with AI across the healthcare spectrum is just try to do those high power pattern recognition tasks, do them extremely efficiently, extremely quickly, and then deliver those insights uh, back to our providers. You know, uh, to build on it a little bit more though, one of the things that we have found and becomes really important when you think about AI in healthcare is it's not good enough to have a brilliant AI solution. It's not good enough to have good sensitivity and specificity for your deep learning model. If you build beautiful data science, if you build this amazing data science, but deliver it into the workflow in a way that actually makes a provider's life harder, makes them go to a new screen, makes them open a new application, makes them go to a different room, um, it won't be adopted. And even if you have that amazing insight, identifying uh, a critical condition, uh, taking time out of a documentation process, it won't be adopted and used. Um, so we have found that just as important as developing the AI and harnessing uh, the, 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 the power that this new technology has brought to healthcare, just as important as building strong AI is how you think through the process of delivering that AI to clinicians, to providers all around the world in a way that feels invisible. Definitely, yeah, we definitely want to come back to that. Well, both of you actually mentioned artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning. You know, not every organization has hit the same level of maturity that Autodesk and GE Healthcare have hit. Can, you know, Carly, can we start with you? Can you tell us a little bit about how you explain AI versus ML versus deep learning? What does that, what does that mean to these organizations? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, you know, it's really a hierarchy. Artificial intelligence is, is, is a science practice that's been around since the 1950s. It encompasses a whole lot. Uh, machine learning is a sub-segment of artificial intelligence, and deep learning is a sub-segment sub underneath machine learning um, that specifically recognizes and looks at large, large amounts of data to almost write code itself. So it mimics the way the human brain works. And if you see enough patterns, if you see enough examples of that data, it's actually able to uh, turn all those data inputs into essentially code or uh, pathways to the right answer on its own. Mike, you know, just building off what Carly was saying, can you tell us a little bit about you know, the, the maturity of AIML, you know, considering the science of it and that the practice of it hasn't always been as mature, right, as some of the ideas? How do you see that evolution? And, how are we starting to see early value? Yeah, you can barely find a university on the planet today that has got a computer science department that's not looking at some aspect of deep learning or some area of machine learning. So there's, there's this rapid uptake of a new technology, which is super exciting. But what, what's also concerning a little bit with that is there's a maturation cycle you have to go with through technology before it reaches a level where it's truly a practice. And I would say, you know, generally, if I looked across industries right now, I would say while the academic advances in the technology have been astonishing, the, the, the actual practices of truly scaling it within a company, really delivering it through products is still really at its very, very infancy. So there's a, we're, we're at this sort of interesting tension point between those two. So I'm incredibly excited, just like Kali is around, around what we can do with deep learning. We are doing work in an area at Autodesk called generative design. 
where we use the computational power to actually examine these incredibly complicated design spaces. It doesn't even use data, but it has this, it is based on optimization algorithms, which is very similar to machine learning. But now we're beginning to couple machine learning with these high computation optimization problems and taking them to an even, even new levels. So as we going, we are discovering new uses for the machine learning, new places we can put it in our products, new problems we can solve for our customers. So our, you know, what, we, what we're seeing right now is the challenge is how do you stay on one hand right at the bleeding edge of this machine learning you know, tsunami that we're in the middle of that's gonna continue for a good long time while at the same time operationalizing that technology, figuring out where you're gonna put it into the products, how are you gonna use it? And again, what Carly said earlier on, you, know, it, you, don't, you don't get to check out on the user interface, right? And in fact, it's even harder than not checking out on the user interface. The nature of user interfaces themselves are fundamentally changing as a result of machine learning. We're, we're talking to our devices, we're gesturing to them. And that's just, the, that we're scratching the surface there as well. So, the, uh, you know, the, there's, there's, in summary, I mean, there's this tons of potential, but we're also in the middle of the sort of slightly operational crisis, I would say, of figuring out how to really make this truly land and be accessible to everyone. You can see that future vision where we don't talk about artificial intelligence or machine learning or deep learning because you're just embedded concepts. But how do you deal with that today? How do you explain the importance of investing in AI and ML to non-technical leaders? You alluded to the HR teams and the finance teams and maybe in some businesses, sales teams or engineering teams. What, what method do you use to address that? Yeah, no, it, it's a great question. I mean, I, 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 I usually point myself to non-healthcare industries and, and say, look, when you type something into Google and it pre-populates exactly what you were going to say, that's AI. You don't call it AI. You don't know it's AI. You just find yourself more effective and efficient in your day, right? When, when, when you finish Stranger Things on Netflix and they immediately suggest the next show that you've been dying to watch, you don't know that's AI. You just know that they have built a product that responds to your needs. And so when I think about um, encouraging, whether it's a marketing team, a sales team, a finance team, to think about how they could use artificial intelligence in the work that they do, it's don't think about the technology first. Think about the problems you're trying to solve. Think about really being able to define what, what it is that takes more of your day, more of your money, more of your team's energy than it should. Understand that problem well. And then also think about partnerships. Not everyone has to build the data science model themselves. That would be a crazy way to approach artificial intelligence. Even at GE Healthcare, we rely deeply on partnerships. So when we are defining a problem to solve, we live in the hospital. We live with our clinical partners, walking in their shoes, understanding their problem um, before we ever start doing the data science aspect of it. So I'm curious, how are you enabling your teams to realize this value? I've heard that you've been working on a center of excellence to drive faster innovation. Yes, yes. So what we did about five years ago, we created a center that we call our AI lab. And it's, as you said, it's our center of excellence in AI. So what that means is this is a group of researchers and engineers who are solely focused at cutting edge AI and working with our product teams to see what problems can we really focus that on. So it, on one hand, it's connecting with academics, it's connecting with the research community and the the, the very bleeding edge of machine learning technology, while on the other side, they are connecting with the product team's problems, the real problems we're dealing with, and then trying to find ways that we can bring these together. What we found is that creating a centralized team brings velocity, it brings attention within the company, and it also brings attention outside of the company. Indeed, one of the hardest things to do right now, and I'm sure Kali's team deals with this as well, is bringing new talent onto your team is a real struggle. There are a lot of companies that are waking up to machine learning and are trying to acquire talent. And the, 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 the salaries are going through the, through the ceiling, the competition is getting harder. So if you have 
a compelling vision for machine learning in your company, and that is a centralized focused vision, you're much more likely to attract top talent into your company. So once we once we created this team, we found as a result, we were able to attract good talent, build the team to a decent capacity, and then begin to work even more significantly with our, with our product teams. Really interesting. So, so Carla, you know, Mike talked about vision and how that can get people excited and attract talent. Can you tell us a little bit about the vision that, that you've gotten to work with around patient care? You talked about that earlier in the first sure. and last mile and how, how you're sort of uh, reacting to that in this space. Sure, no, I, I love what Mike said. I mean, um, you know, I, the, the way I often frame it is uh, you, get, you get this extreme talent to come join your journey by that vision and that mission but you keep them here if they can make impact across against that mission and vision, right? So what do I mean by that? So our mission is um, really a precision health mission, which is being able to do the right thing at the right time for every patient at a global scale. That gets me up in the morning. That gets a lot of people really excited about the impact they can have when they close their laptop at the end of the day, right? So that's the mission. But how do you actually allow progress to be made against a lofty mission like driving precision health at a global scale? Um, we think about platforms, so the tools to allow our data scientists at GE Healthcare to build AI really effectively at scale, and ecosystems, so the ability for us to partner outside of GE Healthcare and bring that innovation in and deliver it to our customers. So platforms, ecosystems, platforms, because as, as Mike was kind of alluding to, I mean, the, the, the dirty secret or the, the, the best kept secret around data science is 85 to 90% of the work is actually not the data science, it's the data preparation. And so what we've done at GE Healthcare within our Edison platform is created a tool specific to healthcare for prepping data, getting it ready for the data scientists, removing the time from that process, making it as efficient as possible, traceability back to where the data came from because we're in a regulated space so that the data scientists have the best chance to move quickly. Uh, we actually use SageMaker, so an AWS tool for the data scientists. But what we've done in our platform is done a lot of industry specific work to get the data ready so that our data scientists can focus their time on building the best AI and then we've worked on platforming to catch that AI and put it inside an X-ray machine, put it inside an MR machine. So an example to make it more tangible um, is right now an, an MR, I, I'm guessing many of you have gone in for an MR scan. It's, it's not very comfortable. Um, you're, you're in a, a small space. It's loud noises. These can take up to 60 minutes to do. Um, prostate cancer, um, the second leading uh, killer, unfortunately, across men at a global scale. Um, one of the best ways to catch uh, prostate cancer and get in front of it in the fight um, is to catch it early in an MR scan. Um, if you're too scared to come in and get that scan, or if that scan can't be fit into a provider's schedule because it takes too long, we miss that chance for early detection. So we've actually created an AI solution that reduces the, that scan time while keeping the quality and the, the beautiful representation of the data just as high. So we've been able to embed that into devices, begin to deploy it at a global scale. And I will tell you, when our engineers and our data scientists and our product folks get to hear from the providers who say, you know, this changes my day, get to hear from the patients who say, this impacts my life or the life uh, of, of a loved one, a family member. Um, that's extremely powerful. And it's, it's, it's my job and the job of other folks who kind of set up some of these platform teams to equip our data scientists with the tools and platform capabilities to deliver that innovation that ties to that vision, vision and mission that probably brought them here in the first place. Really cool. So, you know, it, it's interesting as you Talk about the impact that has for the, the providers and the patients. How do you sort of bring that back to your teams and, and not just sort of start to cultivate a machine learning culture, mm. but, but help them think about the other types of opportunity to apply AIML to?
my perspective on this changed at the point where I started to lead our research team because I realized that the problem we're actually talking about right now is actually true of most advanced technologies. It's, it's part of this maturation cycle that we've been talking about specifically with AI. One of the, one of the ways we, we address this in, inside the research group is to create a number of centers of excellence teams like the AI team I mentioned earlier. We have other teams in robotics and simulation and systems science and human computer interaction. So they're really core technology teams. But what we also did is we created a number of teams that we call industry futures teams. And we have a team per industry that we serve. Um, and these are filled with researchers as well, but they are deep domain experts in say areas of manufacturing or methods of designing buildings or engineering buildings or creating new products in with 3D printing or subtractive manufacturing or whatever. So they are, they are deep, deep domain experts. And what they do, they spend a lot large amount of their time working with advanced customers. So our customers are generally people that are building things for other customers, right? They are, they are architects, they are engineers, they are product engineers, factory engineers, those kinds of people. So what we, what we do is we bring these advanced customers in early on. And while our science teams are developing modern AI techniques, any sort of new innovative technology, the minute that technology technology reaches a point that it's tangible, that we can sort of begin to test the viability of that technology. We find we, we couple that technology with these advanced customers and we actually do collaborative research projects with them. So what happens is we start to get a very early sense of, like I said, the viability of this technology. And, and pretty much like any modern technology, the, the, on the first go around, the answer is no, right? We're gonna have to come back, we're gonna have to work new things out, we're gonna have to understand a bunch of things better. So what we, we tend to do is we do a lot of early iteration just within the research group in the beginning. Once we've, once we've gone through through that iteration for a while and the viability is beginning to become clear, the path to success is becoming clear, the customers are really starting to engage in a significant way and they're getting excited about the solution. At that point is when we start to do much deeper engagement with the product teams because we're not really at that point asking the product teams to go and do deep, deep customer research. They'll still do customer research perhaps within the context of a product, but not really about the fundamental viability of something. We've already shown how a workflow may connect in. We've even connected them in many cases with some of these early customers so they can actually have a leg up in their early customer research. So we, we found that that, that, that cycle, which, I, which is kind of perhaps unique to the way Autodesk is, is set up in our industry, works really, really well. And I found it really exciting to be able to have a research group that operates in that way because we can we can sort of see from soup to nuts how to take a, a, a new technology and make it kind of truly useful. So I'm gonna turn it back to Carly for a minute and ask you, what advice would you give other executives getting started in artificial intelligence and machine learning? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I, I think the the best piece of advice I can give is don't try to do it alone. Um, don't try to do it alone. So what I mean by that is uh, think about core and context for your own business. Um, so what is it that you have deep domain, deep excellence and deep subject matter expertise, um, deep technology investment in? And then how can you layer on artificial intelligence on top of that? Let, let, me, let me give an example at GE Healthcare. Um, when we think about core and context, we make, uh, we make medical devices to tackle precision health, as I said. Um, and so when we uh, apply our own data science and AI resources, we are constantly thinking about how do we make these devices, how do we make these solutions smarter, more intelligent, producing the, uh, the data needed in a shorter amount of time at a cheaper price point, et cetera. But what we've seen emerging is hundreds of startups. Uh, even just in the medical imaging space alone, there's 200 startups, nearing a billion dollars of venture capital backing. 
And we don't want to compete against these guys. We want to partner with them. And so what we've focused on doing in a lot of the use case areas where they play is we've done what I call building bridge and ro- bridges and roads. So we've built the infrastructure in our Edison platform for these uh, newer players and startups to partner with GE Healthcare and quickly get to market to solve healthcare problems. Core context. For the core part of our, our business, where we're thinking about the devices, we're thinking about the solutions that we build, we infuse the AI directly. For the context part of our business, we build the roads and bridges to partner really, really well. Um, and so as you're thinking about your own AI strategy, think about this core and context paradigm and how you lead with your strength and what you've always been good at and then look to partner to bring AI in to make that strength even stronger. Mike, what practical advice would you give other executives who are just getting started in AI ML? So Connie made some excellent points there, which I I strongly agree with. The The one point that I'll emphasize is the importance of platform and specifically when you're dealing with data. So we, we, as, as Autodesk, we, we have an equivalent to, to Edison. Ours is called Forge. Um, it's a platform for designing and making in all of our industries. But its emphasis right now is actually on data. It's actually about creating the place where data comes together. It's about creating the tools around that data and then beginning to roll the experiences and, 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 and everything else on top so people can come together and you can aggregate a, a broad variety of solutions, machine learning solutions together into these more complex workflows. And we as Autodesk, just as as Carly said about GE Healthcare, don't have to do everything. You will fail if you try to do everything. Truly leverage your skills. I think that's pretty great advice. You know, Mike, looking to the future, what are you planning for to stay ahead in in AI ML, both for yourself and for Autodesk and your customers ultimately? Looking into the future, it's all again about others. So it can be about our partnerships with academic institutions. I mean, our research group has, we have partnerships with around about 45 different universities working on a broad range of technologies, everything from simulation and digital twins to interface technologies to machine learning, all of that. So Keeping that really fresh and going, going strong is, is going to be an important part of this. You know, working closely with industry leading partners, people in the industry that are, that are thinking at the cutting edge of, of construction and design practices and building practices and infrastructure. And then finally working very, very closely with our customers too. That, you know, so creating that is going to be a, an instrumental part of being successful. The, the, the other thing that I will say is, 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 maintaining skills in the company you know as a technologist I feel this is my time. <laughs> you know, this is the time of, of learning, of applying my knowledge. But what's exciting about any of us technologists is we love to learn, right? We love to learn new technologies. So this is the time to also create the conditions for continual learning. You know, those academic connections that I mentioned before, the industrial connections are intricate to that, but you have to create the conditions within the company that support that. So that's something I see in the future. And I will say, and it'll be interesting to hear Carly's opinion on this. Um, I actually think we're five percent down the road of machine learning right now. I think what we have seen is really just the very, very initial applications of machine learning. We have ninety-five percent of that road to go down before we really start seeing the full breadth of what machine learning can do in all of our industries. I think uh, Mike hit the nail on the head when he said five percent. You know, I, I've uh, sometimes if you think about it in a baseball analogy, what inning are we in? We're not in the first inning. We're still in T-ball. Like we're learning the fundamentals of how to play this game and really deliver the greatest impact. And so when I think about what are the things that are most important to think not incrementally, but stepwise transformational changes, I think platforming and I think people, and, and I think they're a little intertwined, but platforming, how do we give GE Healthcare employees and our partners outside of GE Healthcare, the best possible tools and processes, um, access to data, access to, to mentors, the best possible way to build AI products at scale, um, that's platforming. 
build fast, deliver easily. Um, if you can get that right, you create a, a center of gravity that people want to be around because the work they can do makes quick impact um, in, in an important sector like healthcare. And then people. Um, all of this uh, always, it, this doesn't need to be an AI panel. This could be a, any technology topic in any industry. It comes down to the people that you attract and retain to solve these problems. And so the two most important things for me as I look to stay on the forefront of solving these important problems in healthcare is, is building the tools, building that center of gravity to continually attract the best people within GE Healthcare and the best partners and people outside of GE Healthcare who want to run fast on this journey with us. Awesome. Well, I'm feeling pretty inspired hearing both of your stories for what you're, the transformation you're driving at both Autodesk and GE Healthcare. I want to thank Carly Yoder, who's uh, Vice President and General Manager of Artificial Intelligence at GE Healthcare, and Mike Haley, who's VP of Research at Autodesk, for joining us today and sharing such amazing stories. Yeah. Thank you for having us, Sean. It was a real pleasure. Yeah, absolutely a pleasure. Thanks for the conversation.